and action. So welcome everyone to the Open Textbook Network's Pub 101. This is meeting three, unit three. Although full disclosure, CFP's call for proposals are covered in unit two. Um, as I mentioned last week, we flipped the call for proposals and the MOUs um, just to accommodate everybody's schedule or our speaker schedules to be more specific. Um, so today we're gonna focus on call for proposals, which do happen before the MOU. Um, I'm going to start uh, with some housekeeping and then I'm just going to take a few minutes to orient us to project management in general and then I'll hand things over to Karen Bjork for the majority of the session and then when Karen finishes we'll have time for your questions and conversation. So as a reminder there's no meeting next week because many of us will be in Phoenix at the Open Ed Conference. If you see me uh, please say hello. If I see you, I will do the same. Um, uh, I guess that's all I was going to say about that. Um, this is a rough transition in my notes. I will also mention that Karen's slides, Karen Bjork's slides, are linked from the Pub 101 document, just as all speaker slides will be. Um, I also wanted to share the call for proposals from the Library Publishing Forum, which is having its conference in May in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, many of us often attend. It's a wonderful conference, lots of great information and colleagues who are working in this space in library publishing, both in OER and in other areas. So um, please consider uh, applying uh, or attending the Library Publishing Forum. I'd also like to thank you for your feedback so far about the publishing curriculum. If you have not shared any feedback about units one, two, or three, please do. Also, it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally someone will rate a unit a three. If you're rating it a three, I would love to know why. Um, it's hard to know why you selected that number without additional information. So. Um, if it's anything below a four or five, please tell us you know, what would make it better, what didn't work for you. Um, otherwise, it's just hard to know what we can improve um, without more information. So I really appreciate that. I'd also like to remind you in our shared document that there is a place to ask questions and engage with one another. Uh, last week after Carla's presentation on MOUs, um, somebody asked a great question about creator certifications and how much do you rely on the um, certification and Carla wrote out a, a very thorough and detailed response that you can see in page 13 of our shared document. So there are some additional conversations happening there and if we run out of time today with Karen, that's an option for you to post your questions there um, if they remain unanswered. So that's it for housekeeping. Um, so what is it that te open textbook publishing project managers do? Um, I might start saying PM for short, PM project manager. Uh, the short answer is, of course, a lot. And that's actually something I saw in the feedback. Someone said, man, it's really overwhelming to see this whole list of things that project managers should be doing. And um, I hear you, it really can be overwhelming. And part of defining your role as a project manager will, of course, emerge as you define your publishing program more broadly. Um, so for example, are you going to provide or connect people with proofreading services? Um, I think, you know, once you answer that question, that will inform your role as a project manager. You can either connect them to somebody or you can say, here's a list, you're on your own, use your project funds. You know, those are kind of the things that you'll be defining as a project manager. Obviously, memorandums of understanding, as Carla talked about last week, project managers will handle that. And Karen's gonna talk about CFPs, which is something typically the PM will handle. In two weeks, we'll be joined by Corinne Guimont, who will talk about managing all of the moving parts while authors are writing and after they have finished their manuscript. And that stage two is something else that PMs typically handle. So during that stage, you might be the intermediary between the author and publishing services professionals like editors and proofreaders. Um, you may be checking links in the document to ensure they go where they're supposed to. It may involve difficult conversations with the author about things they didn't do that you thought they would do and need to do and handing it back to them. Um, one example we talked about in the first week was alt tags. Um, and that's something that maybe we would talk about at this late stage too. So I say all of this really to just kind of orient you and say, 
you know, this is the second of three weeks that we're really dedicating to project management because um, that is likely your role. I know we also have some textbook authors here. Glad you're here. We have instructional designers. Um, and so these project management uh, tasks can vary, but they're probably going to be on your plate. So one key takeaway from our time with Carla last week was timelines. Um, you may remember that Carla shared an anecdote, not scientifically proven, uh, but that about 80% of publishing projects are not on time. So you can see Karen nodding. <laughs> In other words, they're late. And so um, planning for delays will probably be a good um, skill to have in your project management toolkit. And something occurred to me as I was reflecting on this and what, what I wanted to say today, and that is that um, it's really good to keep that in mind. And of course, with your publishing model in mind, to remember that when the author finishes their manuscript, it's not finished, it's not done. That's not, that's not like, okay, now we can publish it tomorrow. Because I think when we think about timelines, a lot of times we think, okay, well, as soon as they're finished writing, you know, the project is finished. But that's really when a lot of heavy lifting comes in, especially I think when you're just starting out. After a few rounds, you might be able to see, man, if we front load this stuff, the, the end part of this process may not be so um, onerous. Um, so many of us have had the experience of our work being invisible. And I think that this is a big problem in uh, publishing is that a lot of times all, this, all the people work, all the people power that goes into making a really solid textbook or other publication um, can sometimes be invisible. And so to protect yourself from that, um, even from it being invisible to yourself, just be sure that you're going to need time um, with that manuscript after the author has handed it off and to sort of plan for the author saying like, I don't understand you know, what's taking so long, you know, when can this be finished? Um, and so just be sure when you're building out your timelines that there's time for you to kind of um, do what you want to do with the manuscript to reflect um, the publishing program that you're running. Again, this could be verifying accessibility, copy editing, graphic design, license compliance. Um, depending on what you're offering, this process may take a few months itself. Um, so just be sure to build in that kind of time. You don't want to create the impression that you're going to turn around and make it happen in a week because the writing is finished and now it can be out there and they can teach with it right away. So to bring this to today, one place where you can start to communicate that reality and make your role visible is in the call for proposals. It's really one of your first opportunities to communicate your program to the campus and to your prospective matches. Again, I say matches because just like with the MOU, there is a matchmaking method. Here to the madness, the CFP is like your dating profile. It says who you are, what you have to offer, and what you want from that other person. But unlike dating profiles, perhaps, it needs to be pretty realistic and honest. I personally don't think there's anything wrong with saying, this is the first time we're doing this, we're going to learn, and so we're looking for someone who's willing to learn with us. So today you're gonna to hear more about project management and how CFP fits into making your life and your program go a bit more smoothly. I'm very glad to welcome Karen Bjork. She's head of digital publishing initiatives at Portland State University. She's going to talk about her experience as a project manager in a very productive open textbook publishing program. And she's gonna cover why CFPs are important and how they can be effective as a communication vehicle. Karen's also a member of the Publishing Co-op, and you can learn more about the philosophy textbook she published through the Co-op in a link that Mark is sharing with you in the chat. And Karen's going to share her guidance on creating call for proposals, then there's going to be time for your questions and conversation. At first, we'll focus on CFPs, and if we exhaust that topic, we can open it up more broadly to your project management questions in general. I'm sure Karen can probably answer every single one of them. <laughs> Not to overstate it. All right, Karen, I'm gonna hand things over to you. Okay, great. Hopefully everyone can hear me good. Yep. Awesome, all right, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, so you should now be seeing my slides. Okay. Oops, there we are. 
So as Karen said, I am head of digital initiatives at Portland State University. Um, so I manage our repository, PDX Scholar, and I lead our open access textbook publishing initiative, PDX Open. As the project lead, I am fully invested in ensuring that all of PSU faculty authors have a positive experience and that they are able to successfully complete their open textbooks. Since inception, PDX Open has published 21 faculty authored open access textbooks. So we've been busy, which is good. Um, as Karen mentioned, uh, so the capacity informs your call for proposal. Uh, so it really does inform your program design. Uh, your call for proposal really communicates your program design and you should really think about your call for proposal as really your first opportunity to com communicate the capacity and author's expectations. So the call for proposal provides your program the opportunity to set priorities and expectations. The CFP is typically how faculty first learn about your program and what you have to offer. It helps you shape what your program is able to offer. It sets the overall tone and defines the spirit of your project. Having the spirit of your project well defined will be extremely helpful as you move forward uh, with your program. So I find myself regularly asking authors if their manuscripts are meeting the spirit of the project. And I use that term a lot. It's a really great way to sort of start that conversation with your faculty. And it allows you to be able to go back to your call for proposal and say, here's what we mean by the spirit of the project. So in your call for proposal, I have found that it's really important to be, be, to be clear and to provide detailed information about what courses or disciplines your publishing program will be targeting. In your CFP, you'll also want to communicate uh, funding and budget models. So for example, will you be offering course buyout? Um, you'll also want to include what publishing services your program will be offering, the criteria for how proposals will be selected, and what your expectations on what the end product will look like. So essentially, you are providing the what to expect before expecting. So there are many open textbook publishing CFPs, as Karen had mentioned, out there. I always recommend that people just look at what other people have done um, because there's really no reason to reinvent the wheel. Uh, a lot of us have similar capacity, and so our call for proposals are going to be along similar lines. Um, so this is what I did when I first got started because I had no idea what I was what I was doing and I'm I will readily admit that and sometimes I still have no idea what I'm doing um, but you know, so we went and looked at what other people were doing. Uh, we sort of drafted it to meet our expectations. And each time we do another round of proposals, we actually go and rewrite our call for proposal. We look back at our past one. We see what we were missing or if we see if there were anything that we're like, oh, we so should have like had more clarity on that. And we go back and redraft and rethink about how we want to move forward. So priorities and check-ins. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, before you release your call for proposal, you'll want to think about and decide what the focus of your grant program is going to be. This is really important. I will tell you, we usually take about a month to write our call for proposal because I want to make sure that every all the stakeholders have an opportunity to look at it to make sure that it is meeting their expectations and to make sure that they have the capacity to do what it is we're saying we're going to do within our call for proposal. So you'll be encouraging faculty, you know, so the question is, is like, will you be encouraging faculty who teach, you know, first year courses? Are you going to be targeting high enrollment? Or do you want to target a particular discipline or area? So for example, our last uh, call for proposal here at PSU, we wanted to target high enrollment courses. So we designed our CFP around that goal. So one of the things that we needed to do was define what we meant by high enrollment. Uh, this actually was very tricky, which really surprised us because our university does not define what high enrollment actually means. So we needed to define it for ourselves. And in the end, we decided that a high enrollment co course had approximately 500 students annually. Um, so these decisions really do shape sort of your selection criteria, as well as who are going to be the members on your selection committee. 
It is also important to include how participants are going to report their progress. Will you be requiring one-on-one -on -one check ins? Is there going to be group monthly meetings? Are you going to have workshops? How will grantees share their successes or talk about their challenges? So at Portland State, we require participants to participate in an OER workshop um, and regular one-on-one -on -one meetings. So the workshop is where the authors really get that opportunity to meet the other grantees and talk about their challenges and successes. And the workshop usually happens within the first six months of our grant cycle. And the one-on-one -on -one meetings are really my way to ensure that the authors are meeting the spirit of the project, as well as the idea to make sure that they're on task, that they are meeting their deadlines, and if they have any questions or concerns, that is the opportunity to really sort of nip things in the bud and quickly move on and make sure that, you know, authors aren't focused or, you know, bogged down in, 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 in trouble or get frustrated. Um, so it's very important to make sure you include this in your call for proposal because again you want to make sure that authors expectate the authors know what they're getting into. So authors expectations, I can't say this enough. Letting faculty know what to expect is really important. Um, Again, it really sets um, and clearly defines the role that the author is going to take. So, you know, your author will not only be writing the text, will your author be making the pedagogical decisions? With, as you as a project manager, are you going to assist with those pedagogical decisions? Or do you have uh, instructional designers that you can send them to? Um, will authors be responsible for finding images and figures? Uh, will they also be responsible for clearing copies? copyright permission. What will that look like? What level of assistance? And then will your authors be editors? Um, will they need to find contributors and reviewers? Um, do you have in-house expectations, you know, sorry, will they be able to find um, their reviewers? And then how will you handle the reviewers? So will authors need to find the reviewers? Um, if so, how many uh, reviewers do they need? Do they need to be affiliated with your institution? Um, in regards to authors being editors, so does your institution have any in-house expertise that you can provide? Is there somebody on your staff that could be a copy editor, for example, or a proofreader? Or will the author need to find their own copy editors and proofreaders? Or will this be a service that your program will offer? Uh, if authors are going to be responsible uh, for finding their own, do you know what kind of criteria do they have in, in doing that? Will they need assistance? If your program is going to be doing the finding, the copy editing, and the designers, um, are you requiring that authors set aside a certain amount of money um, in order for that service to be offered? So, for example, like we just started to. Uh, require that authors spend a minimum of $2,500 for editorial and production services. However, in order to make sure that, uh, you know, authors still had enough money, we actually upped how much money we're offering now for our grants. So we used to only offer $2,500 for our grants, but now we offer $5,000 in order to ensure that authors can get the production services and the design services that they want. Um, but again, this was a decision that we needed to make before we released our call for proposal, and we've added it within our call for proposal. The other thing I do want to mention is we actually have two different versions of our call for proposal. So we have an internal document and we have an external document. So I am saying you have a lot to include and add, and that's really what you put into your internal document. Your external document is really, you know, trying to get your faculty interested in participating and adding some levels of detail, but you don't need to, you know, make sure that it is too dense. That's where the internal document comes from and it's really important to make sure that you have those two documents because then you can always answer questions um, and then what we do is once the the authors are accepted into the program we actually give them the internal call for proposal because it has all of that additional information that may not you know the level of detail that was not included in sort of the external facing All right, final production and timeline. 
So you have to ask yourselves, will authors retain their copyright or will the copyright be transferred to the university? So when we initially started our program, the authors actually had to give the copyright to the university. We were able to work with the university council. Um, so now authors keep and retain their copyright. And let me tell you, that has made a huge difference within our program. We had a lot of authors that actually backed out of the program once they found out that they were required to give their copyright to the university. So for us, it was a real big win when the university council said, oh yeah, sure, that's fine, authors can keep their copyright. Um, you always, again, want to check with your universal, universal uh, blah, blah, blah. want to check with your university legal counsel. That was a mouthful um, before releasing your call for proposal because you do want to make sure that everything is, you know, copacetic and that the university is on board with this. Um, you also want to decide what type of uh, Creative Commons license you will allow. Will they only be allowed a CC BY? Will you allow a, you know, a CC by non-commercial? Uh, would you allow a share alike? For us, the one license we do not allow is no derivatives. Um, they, our authors are not allowed to, to put or have that um, license on their book. And we usually end up, if somebody is interested, um, I have a detailed, uh, com I sit down with them, we have a conversation about it, and I really try to find out why they want to have a no derivative. Um, and usually in the end, uh, we, you know, I've, I've talked them out of it, and they are happy with uh, choosing another license. Um, but it's really kind of part of that education and um, being able to really provide uh, that level of understanding, but you need to make sure that you have decided this before the call of proposal goes out. The other thing you need to decide on is what will a completed textbook look like? Will you define the number of pages, uh, the number of chapters? Uh, will each have a set structure or style? So we include the following statement in our call for proposals. It says, a completed manuscript supports the teaching of an entire course, which is a term for us here at Portland State, and includes a table of contents, consistent chapter elements, features, footnotes, glossaries, etc. So we have that clearly written within our call for proposal. And finally, how long will you give authors to complete the project? As Karen said, you really do need to be flexible, but it is good to define those right away um, and then sort of realize your authors won't meet those timelines. Um, so are you going to give them 18 months, uh, two years? How flexible can you actually be? You know, does your funding define a timeline? If your funding comes from a donor, does the donor have a completion date expectation? And what does that look like? So our first round of open textbooks, uh, we actually required that authors completed their project within a year. Um, and this was requested by the donor who was providing funding. I quickly, quickly realized that a year was not enough time for our authors. So we now allow up to three years to complete a book because we can't offer a course buyout. So our authors are writing their open textbook, they're typically teaching a full course load, and they also have other publishing expectations. So while I do have authors set their own timelines, I always have a very frank conversation with them about their current workload and what it looks like, and sort of this idea of let's take that timeline and expand it by six months. Um, and usually that then allows uh, the authors to not be, not to become frustrated um, or to sort of as they hit, you know, obstacles, they're much more willing to sort of sit down and chat with me or ponder it for a while um, and not feel like they just have to quickly try to get something out and that they're not happy with it. Um, and again, it's about meeting that spirit of the project. I can't say it enough. Ah, all right, budget. <laughs> uh, as a project manager, you have to deal with budget. Um, I don't know how to put this nicely. You do. Uh, budget is the area that takes up the most of my time. And when we first started doing these, that actually was what surprised me the most, is how much time it takes to handle and deal with budget. Um, I really could talk about budget for 
hours. Um, there's a lot that's happening and a lot that's going on. Um, and unfortunately, you know, within your call for proposal, you do need to really think about that. Um, so here are some of the things that you need to think about and decide before you begin. Um, so really think about how is your budget going to be distributed? Are you going to distribute it in one lump sum? Uh, is it going to be distributed the beginning, mid, or end of project? If you do it that way, are there going to be milestones that authors need to hit in order to get paid or in order to get that? Um, or are you going to do a combination of things? So for us at Portland State, we handle, we have a set budget. Each of the authors actually have to create like a budget spreadsheet. They have to identify how they want their money spent. Um, and then we sit down with them and work through what that looks like and sort of their timelines for how the money is going to come out. Most of our authors do pay themselves in the summer and they usually pay um, themselves, usually about half of their budget goes to just paying themselves to do the work. So the question about OPE, um, will you cover? So when we talk about OPE, we're really talking about the employer paid taxes and uh, Social Security and Medicare. I always want to make sure I stress and mention this because it was one thing we initially didn't even think about. It, we, we, for some reason, completely forgot about OPE until all of a sudden it hit and, you know, we were trying to scramble to figure out how we were going to cover uh, OPE. So you have to, so if you are going to be offering a stipend, for example, of $2,500, will the faculty receive the gross wages of $2,500 or will they actually only receive about $2,000, for example, after taxes and OPE are taken out? And how will this affect your overall budget? So if you have $10,000, for example, set aside for your open text for publishing, and if your library is going to be covering the gross wages in OPE, you actually will need something more like twelve to $13,000 in order to make sure you cover that. So those are things that you do need to think about um, and talk to your budget analyst beforehand. So in talking to your budget analyst, um, this is sort of answering how will your institution handle the contracts. So for us, we are required to do contracts for everything. If we pay our authors, we have have to do a contract. If an author wants to hire, for example, a student, we have to do a contract for that. So the question is, is who is going to be handling those contracts? How will that be done? Do you have an HR representative that you've spoken to to make sure that you're not violating um, any contracts or laws? We sat down and had a good hour-long conversation with our HR person before we released our call for proposal to make sure we knew sort of how we could pay people and sort of what the laws and regulations are. Um, the other thing, too, to think about is sort of who is overall going to be responsible for the budget? Is it going to be yourself or is it going to be the budget analyst? Um, how will you communicate? So for us, we have uh, a number of spreadsheets and we document everything. And I meet with our budget analyst every uh, week to check in to ensure things are on track. Um, because we have to essentially manage contracts. We have to know when they get sent out, when they get signed, when the work is done, when it gets sent out to get paid, if the person has been paid. So these are all the things that you need to think about and consider. And again, it's not something you would put on your external call for proposal, but it's definitely something you want to document in your internal because you'll want to go back and be like, what was it we decided? How are we going to handle this? And this plays into the what type of expenses um, can be paid for and what will not be paid for. Is there anything that you will not pay for? Uh, I'm trying to think, I mean, we've, I think we've said yes to everything. Um, I'm not aware of anything we wouldn't pay for, but you know, there might be something that comes up and I, would have to, to speak to our my budget analyst to be like, is this something the university can do? Um, so it's really about having an understanding of, of how university uh, budgets work. Um, and again, there's a lot to consider and it can become very complicated and overwhelming, but that's why documenting, 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 and talking to people beforehand will really help you in the long run. Um, and again, it's really just about making sure you have those clear lines of communication between the stakeholders, not only the author, but you as the project manager, but also the other people that you're working with. Lessons learned. 
there's a lot. <laughs> I'm still learning them. Um, after, you know, the number of call proposals we have done, number of textbooks, every day I'm still learning something new. Um, I was just actually telling Karen before we started that I, I have several questions uh, for our publishing co-op that have just come up that I met with an author and I'm like, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and it's okay. So again, be specific. Uh, write the internal and the external call for proposal. Document as much as possible and create an FAQ. This will not only help you field questions, it will also document the decisions that were made. So again, for your budgetary stuff, you could put that within your FAQ. You could say what will be paid, what will not be paid. You could talk about sort of the contracts. You could talk about the, the production services, if there's going to be a minimum requirement. All of that can be put into your FAQ and you can point to it um, through your external call for proposal. Have a clear selection criteria. Who are you targeting? Again, like Karen said at the beginning, if you only want to take on one or two textbooks, be very clear about that. Say, look, we're just getting started. We want one or two really enthusiastic authors, then that's great. That's perfectly fine. But make sure you're very clear about that. If you, if you wanted to target world languages, make sure you document that and make sure you know that you know that that's what you're going to do. I always say it is better to really uh, clearly define who you're targeting rather than just doing a broad sweeping proposal because it'll make sure that you're getting very well thought out proposals and people that you know are going to be able to complete them. It also ensures that you're not disappointing anybody or, you know, starting your program off on the wrong foot to find out, oh, you've had to turn all these people down because you don't have the capacity. Um, and again, it is okay to reject proposals. I, this year, ha had the uh, happy fortunateness, I don't know how to really clearly say that, um, that we had more proposals than we had funding. Uh, it was a nice thing to have, but it also was hard because I had not said no to really good proposals before, and that was a really difficult thing for me to do, but it created some really great conversations uh, with the faculty that were interested. And we were able to talk about, you know, if there's other grants out there. So, you know, Portland State, for example, is part of the or is part of um, Open Oregon. Open Oregon has other grants. So I was able to point those authors to those other grants. I'm still working with several of them as well. Uh, so as they're creating their OER material and then hoping that they'll be able to apply for the next round. Um, but you, your open textbooks that are published are really a representation of your program. You want to make sure that your, pro, that your books are the best book that the author can produce and that it meets the spirit of the project. Uh, and it really is how you advertise, highlight what it is you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, and people are take no okay, um, I have found. Uh, but yeah. I, it, you know, it is, it is a good thing to have, but be very clear on to why you're rejecting. Don't just say no, you know, you can usually meet, like for us, a lot of the projects didn't quite meet our selection criteria. So we were able to utilize that and say, well, this was a really strong, here's our selection criteria, which was in our call for proposal. Unfortunately, you know, our priority were high enrollment and your course did not meet that high enrollment standard. So it was, you know, it was an easier way to really be able to say, know and our call for proposal was able to provide that. Um, so an opportunity to create awareness on campus. As I said at the beginning, this is usually the first time that faculty hear about your open textbook publishing program. Uh, so it is the great way to be able to uh, create that awareness, to talk about open educational materials, to talk about you know, what's going on within with students and really be able to have that discussion. And your call for proposal is, 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 your, is that, that first sort of message. Um, you want to be able to talk about what are the benefits for, for participating. What is the author going to get out of it? Talk about the global impact. What does it mean to create material, you know, uh, directly for the students for the, you know, for the course that they teach? How is that going to shift and change their pedagogy? It's really an uh, interesting conversation. Um, we currently cannot talk about PNT. Uh, it is not, you know, an open textbook does not count uh, towards PNT. 
uncertainty. Um, but it is a question that comes up and a discussion that I have. Um, and so, you know, I always want to make sure that faculty are really clear about that before they before they get started. Um, and sort of what expertise as a program manager do you bring to the program? You know, what is it that, that you are able to offer? But also, you know, who could you bring in to help you? You should not be doing this alone. You should be utilizing the members within your staff, um, within the library to assist you, as well as university campus. We have created some really great relationships with our Office of Academic Innovation. They are the folks that um, are instructional designers. We've created really great relationships with um, other faculty that are really interested in, in OER that have published open access textbooks who are now being part of our program. Um, so you're not doing this alone. Sometimes it does feel that way, but there's a lot of people on campus that are really interested. So trying to find who they are and who your stakeholders are going to be is really, really important. And again, as I just mentioned, the opportunities for campus partnership. Who could you connect with? How could you create stronger relationships? Um, and for us, it's just been great. We've been able to create a really strong relationship with our instructional designers, which has then also shaped other programs that we've been doing across campus because we already have these relationships. All right, so questions to consider. Um, do you, uh, is this, Karen, something that you're shifting to? Uh, either way, they're just questions that we pose to all of you for um, thinking about your call for proposals. You'll notice that there's an optional homework assignment, something you could spend your time working on is, of course, creating your CFP. And so this bulleted list is just a few things to think about as you do it. So would you want people to submit writing samples as part of the application? Uh, do you want to support multiple authors or just one? Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, um, so we do require writing samples as part of our call for proposal. We do want to ensure that the faculty member um, has a well thought out uh, proposal and that includes have do they have any type of samples that they can provide and share it gives us a really good opportunity to sort of look and see where they're at with their project but also um, how excited they are about creating a project because they do have to do that extra work we also require that the department share uh, write a letter of support for each of the authors and again the reason for that is because uh, you know the the book will not only be representing our program but it also is representing the department that the faculty member um, you know is in because all of our books we clearly state what course the book is designed for and who the book is is written by so we want to make sure that the chair knows that the author is wanting to do this uh, knows that the author or the faculty member will be spending their time um, you know writing the book um, and just making sure that the chair is really on board with that um, we let's see for, so we do provide some levels of tech support. It's kind of difficult. Um, it really is based on the, the area uh, that uh, the book is written in. So there are some software programs that I really I don't, I can't help with. Um, but if it's something that I don't know or don't have the expertise, I usually go and um, send them to somebody who does. So we do provide uh, overall support that includes tech support, but it really does depend on sort of what the needs are for the author. We require peer review. Um, our peer review is open peer review, and again, that's stated in our call for proposal. So the faculty actually identify who will be reviewing their books, and they send out their manuscripts to those reviewers. The reviewers must teach uh, in the area in which the book is created for. Uh, one of them can be affiliated with our institution, but we do require that two outside reviewers are asked. And really, the review is more of a pedagogical review. It's much more so of, if I were to use this book in my course, what is missing? What is needed? Are there any points of clarity? Because in the end, while the book is designed specifically for the courses that they teach, we also want to be able to have the books be adopted 
adopted by other universities. And so we see that it's really important to have those books tested and looked at and reviewed by faculty that are teaching at other universities in that area. We also use our peer review as a way to essentially advertise the book. So we ask the reviewers to send comments about the book, and then we like to use those in our advertisements, um, as well as to ensure the quality, because that's one of the things that is always asked about is our open textbooks of a high, high enough quality, for example. And we can point and say, yes, all of our books have been through a, a level of review and peer review. Um, and then do we want to ensure that someone else has reviewed the project before it's uh, published? Yes, all of our books have to go through copy editing. Um, if it's not going to be supplied uh, through Scribe, um, then it needs to be contracted out. We need to know who the copy editor is. Um, and I usually, what I usually like to do is I usually like to see the manuscript uh, before it went through copy editing and then after, because that gives me the opportunity to be able to verify that either the author hasn't uh, violated any copyright and the author is still meeting the spirit of the project and is, is creating a completed manuscript. Um, and that sort of helps uh, sort of shape sort of, you know, where they're at with their timelines and, and sort of getting that feel. Um, but yes, uh, we now do require that they all go through a level of copy editing and review before it gets sent out. Um, so beyond written text, uh, what do we support? So we support uh, videos, uh, we support illustrations, um, we do, one of our authors, for example, had a website that uh, they created. So we worked with our centralized IT department to be able to support that. Uh, we at this time don't really have the capacity to support the interactive experiences. Um, we are looking into that, but that is just not something that, that we have. Um, and we've had uh, textbook authors uh, actually, you know, say no, they don't want to participate with our program anymore because the interactive experiences were really important to them. And because we weren't able to offer it, it just, you know, wasn't going to, to suit their needs. So, yeah, I think. I offer. I think I answered everything. Great. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. Uh, please join me in thanking Karen for sharing her experience and her expertise. Um, as you think about what kind of questions you would like to ask, there were a couple in the chat from Ray. Um, please, please either post them in the chat and Mark and I can catch them there or feel free to unmute. Um, I'll, I'll add a couple of, of things as I was listening to Karen. Um, it just occurred to me, again, that this can be very overwhelming and you're hearing so much of Karen's experience that she's accumulated over years of trial and error, if you will, um, you know, working with colleagues. And so if you are feeling that sense of, oh man, this is way too much, um, it is a step-by-step -step process um, and it, it will, you know, this, this knowledge will accumulate as you move through the cycle, the call for proposals, working with authors that will start to sink in. And even if you don't have, you know, big funds or a staff to call upon, you do have the community within the OTN who has this experience. You can ask for their um, support and expertise. Uh, and um, Karen, I was wondering while we wait for, um, for additional questions. Oh, actually, I see one here. Uh, one from Cheryl. Cheryl would like to know what platform PDX Open uses for publishing. So we are B Press people. So we use uh, B Press to actually publish our books. Um, I am in the process of investigating if we are able to get our books uh, into press books um, as well as another option. Um, it is not something that uh, we are currently doing, but it is something I'm, I'm considering um, as I'm sort of looking at other ways to provide sort of more edit editable, editable versions of our book. But yeah, all of them are uh, published in um, our institutional repository, which is run by B Press. And Karen, while Scribe is not a publisher, which I think is a really important distinction, they do help with the production of different file types. Could you say yes. a word about um, how you've worked with them to publish books? 
Sure. Um, so Scribe has been really great for us um, because we work with them. All of our authors, as I said in the beginning, um, are required to set aside a minimum of um, money to go through the publishing um, for the, the the production as well as the um, editorial. So Scribe for us uh, does all the copy editing. Um, it also does the design and the layout um, as well as the book cover. And this really for us is we wanted to be able to offer press like services but not tech but we are not a press we don't have the capacity within the library to be able to offer that and we just found that um, our authors were asking for their books to to look and of sort of higher quality um, and it was becoming a real need and we also wanted uh, to ensure that our books had a centralized kind of look and feel so scribe has been able to really help us in that respect um, and it's it's been great. I can't say enough like wonderful things about Scribe uh, because this is something for me that is extremely new. I don't have a publishing background. Um, I've never worked in the press. So there's a lot of language um, that I'm not always familiar with. And I'll be talking to Scribe's project manager and he'll say something and I'll be like, uh, I have no idea. I know, I know these words are in English, but I really don't know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and Scribe has been really great in regards to meeting timelines and expectations um, and you know I send everything uh, to scribe and, and work directly with their project manager and they really do that editorial and that production piece that we just are not able to offer um, in-house and so they do provide in regards to format so we get them as a PDF but then we also have the capacity to uh, have our books done um, as e as ebooks. So we have done the the Mobi and the ebook uh, file as well. So that's been a really great um, sort of addition for us as well. Yeah, Scribe's uh, workflow is based in Word, which a lot of authors already know how to use and are comfortable using. So that's another potential benefit if you don't want to ask your author to learn how to use an additional tool, they can work in a tool that they're already quite comfortable in. And I find that most of my authors actually write their books in Google Docs. Hmm. So they're able, because there's a lot of collaborative work that is going on with the creation of the book. And so then they're able to download it as a Word document and send it to me once they're sort of ready for that, that next step. Great. Karen, you mentioned that you made a lot of mistakes in the beginning and one <laughs> one that you pointed to was related to OPE I forget what that stands for uh, I, I you know I know it when I'm looking at it and now I'm blanking Other things in a budget it. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, what is it operational I don't it's essentially your Social Security yes. and Medicare and ta employer taxes yeah. retirement yeah and you mentioned not thinking about the other personnel <laughs> Other personnel. There you go. Employed paid taxes. Expenses. Yeah. Thank you, Michaela. Um, so you mentioned that was, you know, one of your mistakes. You didn't think about that in the beginning. Can you share other mistakes? Um, they don't have to be. Sure. You know. um, yeah. So one of the mistakes that we <laughs> that we made at the beginning was uh, we had our authors. They got accepted into the program and I just let them loose. And I would like email them every so often, but I never actually physically sat down and had a conversation with them. Um, and for some reason, I decided that maybe I should, and this was getting near the end of their cycle. And so I was concerned because I hadn't really heard from any of them and I was concerned as to if they were gonna meet their timelines. And I had a meeting with one of the faculty authors uh, and I you know we sat down and he I was asking him about like some of the challenges and he started to tell me about how he has spent the summer trying to essentially get permission from uh, Elsevier to be able to put articles in his open access textbook and he was just really surprised that you know he wasn't getting the the necessary permission or he was you know going and it was costing um, quite a lot of money and he just you know he he had spent the entire summer and it wasn't just Elsevier it was Springer it was Wiley it was all the major publishers and it was yeah it was very eye-opening because I had to essentially 
take a step back, talk to him about, you know, what versions of articles you can put in, how this all works. The fact that, you know, just because you know the author of the article doesn't mean you can put in their full text version and copyright and uh, how to find free and open access. Had I met with him earlier, this would have never have happened. He would have never have spent the whole summer doing this research and discovering that he couldn't. And I felt like he was getting pushed back further and further because of that. So I now do regular check-ins that meet that every three months I am meeting face to face. They are, the authors are bringing their manuscript to me. We are going through questions that they have concerns, challenges, and that has really made sure that people stay on track. And it's been really, really important in that respect. Um, I also had another author along the same lines who was very, uh, ambitious and really excited and had this amazing project and he was uh, going through the tenure process ended up getting a grant and all of his work came to a halt and so we needed to figure out essentially how to get his book done and meet the spirit of the project because he was not going to be able to complete and this was at the time where we had more really well-defined timelines and now there's a lot more flexibility with that as well um but it was yeah it was quite a shock when all of a sudden he was like i can't do this anymore and i was like uh <laughs> no you have to so trying to figure out how to so what we ended up doing was um, he worked with collaborators. We took the rest of his money that he had and we he essentially paid other people to write chapters for him and then he did the editing of it and we were able to get it done, but we really had to be creative and try to find ways. And again, I should have been meeting with him more often uh, than I was um, just because, you know, I, what I thought, you know, he would have told me this before, but you know, it's, it's, it's really about making sure that, you know, while you want to give your author sort of that time and space to work, you do need to have those regular check-ins and to really see what it is they're working on um, and to have them show. I, I find that's really important. That connects to a question that Ray had in the chat about, you know, what do you think about um, asking for sample chapters as part of the call for proposals or along the way? And I think what you said, Karen, really emphasizes you know what what I said too which is it's great to know what's going on and so you know for those of you who are feeling overwhelmed about this like never ending to do list of th of things involved in project management perhaps one key takeaway is just scheduling that one on one time even if you don't have a checklist that you're going through just getting together and checking in and communicating um, will provide the opportunity for you and the author to, to sort of clarify your roles and see where maybe there's misunderstandings and kind of keep things moving along rather than, you know, as Karen said, it's like, great, we've identified the projects, you know, let us know when it's done, see you in a couple of years. And then, oh, <laughs> wait a minute, here's a surprise. Yeah. Um, so perhaps, you know, that's kind of the, the primary tool you can keep in your toolbox if you're feeling like there's so much here. One takeaway is just keep those communication channels open. And um, I do want to say on that same note, so one of the successes we had because we started meeting, because I started meeting more regularly with authors, I have a more recent author that uh, was starting her book from scratch and she was off and running and the first couple meetings I had with her, she was doing really well and then all of a sudden she hit a wall. And she contacted me right away when she hit this roadblock and this right, you know, she and we sat down because I already had that pre-established relationship with her because she knew that, you know, I would be contacting her in like a couple, you know, in like a couple weeks, she proactively came to me and said, Karen, we need to meet, we need to sit down. I, I, I'm running into some really big issues. So she and I sat down and we were able to brainstorm, you know, what, what was happening, where her challenges were. Um, and she essentially was able to become so much more successful. And her book, I believe, which it's going to be published soon is going to be a lot better because she, we already had that pre-established relationship and she knew me, she knew she could contact and she knew it was okay to say, I'm struggling. 
I, I thought I was on the right track. I don't know now everything just, it's just not working. So it was, it, in that respect, it, it really did benefit then her because she has continued on and is really proud now of what it is she's creating and has been able to find her groove again. I really appreciate that point because a lot of times we frame this as, you know, authors not meeting deadlines or, you know, crazy, crazy things going off the rails. But really, it's also the case that authors need support and they're looking for guidance and they want someone with the expertise that you have. And so it's about building a supportive relationship where both of you ideally can be honest with one another about, well, this, you know, this isn't going the way I thought it would or, you know, this is. Um, different than what I expected. And as Regina said in the chat, regular check-in is really important. And she yeah. does it um, about every other month or so. Ray, I see your question about managing relationships and tools for doing that. And Corinne will talk about it a little bit um, in two weeks from now. There's not like um, a very predominant tool, but there are options out there. So um, we'll talk about that. Karen, do you have a particular tool that you use? My smile. No. Um, <laughs> email. <laughs> my email. Yeah, I, you know, that's one of the things I have personally have struggled with um, is sort of the project management tools and what to use and, and how to um, sort of, you know, be able to kind of manage those. I use, because we have Google Suite here, I use Google for everything. Like I have stuff in my calendar. I have, you know, if people can't meet with me physically, we do Google Hangout, um, Google Docs. I, you know, it's, that's kind of how I do it. And, and um, I usually just try to meet people for coffee, make it much more of a comfortable environment, not just let's go to the library and sit down and chat. It's like, hey, let's go grab a go grab a cup of coffee or let's have a walking meeting. Like I try to make it a more casual um, thing because at the end of the day, I don't have a lot of money to offer these authors. They are doing it because they, you know, are passionate about this. And I want to make sure that we are keeping their energy up, their excitement up, um, and really making sure that it is a very good and comfortable relationship. So... Well, thank you, Karen, and thank you, everyone, for your questions and your comments in the chat. If something occurs to you after we adjourn today and you're like, oh, why didn't I ask Karen Bjork this? It would solve all of my problems. Um, you can go ahead and post it in our shared document. Mark put in the link earlier, but I just added it there again. Um, this is October 23rd, so you could add something there on page 14 after meeting questions. And um, Karen can, uh, can help us kind of move along. In terms of your homework, um, between now and our next meeting on November 6th, again, we do not have a meeting next week because of open ed, um, you may want to, or your homework is actually, to watch Implementing a Publishing Program. Uh, this is about a 45 minute video presentation. Perhaps you can watch it on the plane if you're going to open ed. Um, and again, you know, another um, homework option is to start thinking about what do I want my call for proposals or my MOU to say and exploring Portland State or other institutions and see what they've done and start customizing and thinking about um, Tamara's comments, you know, we can't do everything. Um, we need to strike a balance with what we're doing and just thinking about how you can reflect that in those documents. Um, so Larry wanted to know how to pronounce my last name. So it's uh, Bjork, rhymes with New York. And if you know the singer. Nice. Though I'm not Icelandic. Um, thank you all so much uh, for, for listening. I hope that uh, what I have uh, provided was helpful and useful. Um, and again, please if, feel free to reach out to me or to add questions to the documentation. Um, I'm always learning something new. So, you know, that's why I keep doing this because it's fast. I love it. So I won't be at Open Ed, but I'll be at Charleston. So if anyone's at the Charleston conference. And you'll be at Library Publishing Forum. Yes. In May. That's a in May. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Because I am, I am on the Library Publishing uh, Board, Coalition Board. So yes. I will be there as well. And Karen is a member of the Publishing Cooperative, as we said earlier. So if after Pub 101 you decide to join, you can always post your questions and she'll be um, in that group and can, can help answer them. Um, I will just say, uh, if you want even more on building publishing programs, we do have a panel at Open Ed. 
Um, I invite all of you to attend. I will be facilitating an expert panel at different stages and different contexts, and they'll be talking about um, how they work to get things off the ground. Um, Mark, is there anything you would like to add about Open End next week before we adjourn? No. <laughs> Does that, sil that silence perhaps means no? Sometimes people are unmuting and it takes a second. Okay, I'll take that as a no. All right, everyone. Oh, wait, he uh, unmuted. Oh, wait. No, we, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, I think you put your presentation in um, just as a reminder that we're also having a happy hour for OTN members and people affiliated with OTN members. Um, I'll put the evite in the chat. And if you could RSVP, if you haven't done so already, that would be super. Thank uh, you. That's it. Yeah. It's on Halloween, so you can dress up if you'd like to. Yeah, I'm, I'll try and bring my cap. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thanks again, everybody. And see you in two weeks. And please um, join me in thanking Karen. Thank you. Farewell. Thank you.